Okay, so for the quiz, let's see, this is quiz 5.1 to 5.3. On this quiz, pretty much, you're going to be asked at least once to find a maximum, a minimum, a con or if something is concave up or something is concave down. Um, where there's an inflection point, uh, what else? All those different things. Um, and did I list everything? Did I say everything? All the different things? Yeah. Speeding up, slowing down. What's that? Concave up and down. Inflection points. Increasing, decreasing, like any of those things. You're going to be using the first and second derivative number line test in order to do it. Okay, so um, I have these questions here. Like I said, I have a couple. I, I have a couple more questions too um, on another slide that I was hoping to pull up too if we have time. So here it says find all absolute and local extrema and their location. So for this one, a graph is given. All right. So there's no you know first derivative number line test that you need to do if a graph is given of an original function, okay? And you know this by how it's labeled here. This is just h of x. It's not h prime of x at all, okay? So I would say this thing has an absolute max of what? Uh-huh. Three, good. When x equals one. Remember, when they ask for these, we want to write them as a statement like that, saying what the max or min is and where it is. Okay? Yes? Um, if you accidentally said x instead of when, uh, <coughs> would you still receive x instead of That's perfectly fine. Yes. <laughs> yep. All right. And then absolute min of, what's the minimum? Negative 3. Add here. At x equals, I'll do it both ways to show you, it's, it's fine. At x equals negative 1, okay? And then also it says for the local. So these are not right on the nose, these next two. We could say this guy right here is a local, what would he, would he be? Max, good. Of something when x equals negative 4, but you'd have to say like, and, and here, you'd have, you know, flexible answers. Negative 0.75, negative 0.8, somewhere in there, any of those answers would be okay. And then for this one here, a local minimum of 0.75 or 0.8 or something right around in there when x equals 4. So that's if a graph is given that way. All right, next one. This is distorted. Find the value or values of C that satisfy f of b minus f of a over b minus a equals f prime of C for the function f of x equals x squared plus 3x plus 2 on the interval from 2 to 3. What is this asking me to use? What is that called? Uh-huh. It is something value theorem. Someone help them out. Mean value theorem. This is the mean value theorem. That's what they're asking you to use. This is the definition of the mean value theorem exactly. Okay? So for the mean value theorem, the first thing I have to do is I have to say, all right, well, that's a parabola. F of x is continuous on 2 to 3 and differentiable on 2 to 3. In order for the, this here to ever be true, this has to be true itself. So I need to state that. Okay. Next, I use these two x values right here to come up with their respective y values. And I plug them into that. I get 4 plus 6 plus 2, which is 12. And 9 plus 9 plus 2, which is 20. So I just got the point 212 and 320 
that I can turn around and use to find the slope. And that's what this part here is referring to. So I need to show my work that I'm, I'm finding that. So 20 minus 12 over 3 minus 2 is 8 over 1, which is just 8. There's my slope. The next thing I need to do is what this right side is stating, f prime of c. So I start with f prime of x, which is 2x plus 3. And I replace it with a C. So again, you've got to show each of these steps. I am showing you the bare minimum right here for this problem. Okay? So make sure you have all of this. Whenever you see that in the direction, it is the mean value theorem that you're using. Okay? And then my final step is actually setting them equal and finding C. So 2C plus 3 equals 8. Subtract 3 from both sides, I get 2C equals 5. And then divide both sides by 2, I get C equals 5 halves or 2.5, whichever you want. Okay. So this question on the quiz tomorrow, I believe, is multiple choice. But I still expect to see all of that. Okay. In order to get full points on that problem, I need to see each part. Questions on that one? Anything at all? Okay, the next one. Find the intervals on which the function is increasing and decreasing. And so this here that's given is f of x equals 7x squared plus 4x. So I need to take and find the derivative of it, which is 14x plus 4, and set it equal to 0, and then do my number line test. So this here gives me 14x equals negative 4, and x equals negative 2 sevenths when I divide both sides by 14. So I go to my number line. Here's negative 2 sevenths, negative infinity, positive infinity, and I pick values around them maybe negative 1 and 0. I plug them into the derivative to do the derivative test. Plugging the negative 1 in, I get negative 14 plus 4, which is negative 10, so that section is negative. Plugging the 0 in, I get 0 plus 4, which is 4, which is positive. And so this is increasing from negative 2 sevenths to infinity. And it's decreasing from negative infinity to negative 2 sevenths. What else could I gather from this right here? I wasn't asked on the problem, but uh huh. There's a minimum on this, right? Okay. And if I wanted to know where the minimum was, I'd have to, I mean, I know where it is, but I don't know what it is. I'd have to plug this back in over to the original problem to find it, right? All right, next one. Find all possible functions with the given derivative, 4e to the 4x. So this is saying that they're giving you the derivative, so sometimes it's even hard to see that little guy right there. But remember, I have to do the antiderivative, okay? Well, the antiderivative of e to anything is just e to itself, right? Just like the derivative is. So I'm going to have 4e to the 4x. But then I have the reverse chain rule. Normally, I'd multiply by 4, but for the antiderivative, I'm going to divide by 4. And then I need a plus c on the end. So this here is e to the 4x plus c. It says find all possible functions. That's saying you have to have the plus c. So maybe it's e to the 4x plus 2. Maybe it's e to just e to the 4x. Maybe it's e to the 4x minus 7. You know, we don't know. So you have to have the plus c. That's what the all possible solution to this kind of thing is. Okay. Questions on that one? Yes. Um, is that e to the 4x plus c or is that 4x plus c? It's e to the 4x and then plus c. <laughs> Okay. 
All right, next one. Find the function with the given derivative whose graph passes through the point P. So this one here is telling me that f prime of x equals x minus 8 and is asking me to find f of x. Of course, when I do have the plus c on the end, then I'm going to have to plug the point in in order to find what c is. All right, so this is polynomial in nature. So I add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent for an antiderivative. Currently, it has a 1 as an exponent. So I'm going to say x to the second divided by 2. This currently has an x to the 0. So when I find the antiderivative, it's just minus 8x to the first over 1. And then plus c. And here's where then the point comes in. I plug it in. Teachers, please pardon this interruption. All right, and then plugging the 1 in here, I have minus 8 and then plus c. And so 7 equals negative 7 and a half plus c. Add 7 and a half, I get 14 and a half. Or if you like that better as 29 halves, I, I don't care. Okay, um, so we go back and we have to plug it in here. So f of x equals x squared over 2 minus 8x plus, I don't know, what do you like, 29 halves, 14 and a half? Questions on that one? Next, use the first derivative test to determine the local extrema of the function and identify any absolute extrema. And so this one here, hopefully, that you see, this is a uh, product rule, right? We have an x and then an e to the 5x. So I do need to use product rule when I take the derivative. The derivative of the first is 1 times the second, which is e to the 5x. Then this time, the first one stays the same. And I need the derivative of the second, which is e to the 5x times 5. Then from there, I would need to factor it e to the 5x factors out, it gives me 1 plus 5x, and I set it equal to 0. e to the 5x does not ever equal 0, okay? But this here equals 0 when x is negative 1 fifth. I could just set it equal to 0 if you can't do that, you know, just looking at it. I go to my number line. Here is negative infinity and positive infinity. I need my negative one-fifth there. I need to choose values around it. And I test them. When I test them, I put it into the factored form is the easiest. When I plug a negative one in, e to the negative first, e to anything is positive, right? It would just be one over e to the fifth is what it would be in that posture. Okay, I plug the negative into the second one. I have 1 minus 5. That's going to be negative, so negative overall. And then I plug the 0 in, e to the 0 power. Anything to the 0 power is 1, but an e to anything, right, is positive. And then 1 plus 0 is 1, so that's positive. So this section is positive. So it's asking here um, for local extrema of the function. So we have a local... What is this when it goes minus plus? Min of, I gotta find it, when x equals negative one fifth. So I have to go back to the original function to plug it in. Y of negative one fifth is negative one fifth e to the five times negative one fifth, which is negative one fifth e to the negative first or negative 1 over 5e. If you move the e downstairs, it'll take care of the negative exponent. You can put it as that or this. Both answers are correct. Okay. This question, quite honestly, for AP is a multiple choice question. Okay. Now, absolute extrema. For this particular problem, this graph, think of the graph of x, right? It does this. Think of the graph of E, E goes like this, right? It doesn't have any absolute, you know, maxes or mins with those functions. Like the E could have an absolute, like it gets down to zero, but it never hits it. So it's not going to be an absolute minimum. 
So the two functions together are not going to have an absolute max or min unless they put it on an interval and they say only from one to seven where these are cut off. In which case you have to plug the one in, you have to plug the seven in, and then you also have to compare them to this guy here and see which one is the lowest or the highest, whatever, since this is a min, it'd be an absolute min that you'd be comparing for. Okay, but this one doesn't have any absolute extreme, only like one. Next one, use the concavity test to find the intervals where the graph of the function is concave up. Okay, so like this question, I could have asked concave up, I could have asked concave down, I could have asked for an inflection point. All right, so I need the second derivative. So 3x squared minus 6x minus 5. I don't care about maxes and mins are increasing and decreasing right here, so I don't have to worry about doing anything with the first derivative test. I go right to the second derivative, 6x minus 6, set it equal to 0. This would be where x is 1. And I'm doing the second derivative number line test. x cubed goes negative infinity to positive infinity. Here's 1. And I test values around it. I go back to the second derivative to determine this. Plugging a 0 in, I get 0 minus 6, which happens to be negative. And plugging the 2 in, I get 12 minus 6, which happens to be positive. So this here is concave up, that was the question, from 1 to infinity. But if the question said concave down, I would say negative infinity to 1. And if it asks for an inflection point, I would say it has 1. When x is 1, and then I have to plug the 1 back into the original function to find the y value. If I wrote both concave up and concave down, what is the point of dividing the concave down? Well, what you want to do is just make sure you put the correct answer on the answer line. Okay? okay. If I wrote both as the same as well, what is the point of Yeah. So you've got to answer the question. Okay? I do have some of them as multiple choice, in which case he wouldn't want to pick the one that has concave up and concave down. You know, you want to make sure you only pick the one with concave up. Find all points of inflection for this right here. So again, we kind of go through the same thing, going all the way to the second derivative. So the first derivative is 21x squared plus 2. The second derivative is 42x. When I set it equal to 0, it's when x equals 0. So for this right here, I plug numbers in on either side, like maybe negative 1 and 1. Plugging the negative 1 in right here, I get negative for that. I get positive for that. So... It has an inflection point when x is 0. But the inflection points are actual coordinate points. So you have to make sure you find the y value. So plug it back in up here. y of 0 equals 0 plus 0 plus 9, which is 9. So my inflection point is at 0, 9. It's concave down from negative infinity to 0. It's concave up from 0 to infinity. You know. Like, you're, there's other questions that could come from it, but I, most of the questions I'm just, like, asking one thing. You know, you don't have to answer all of them. Next one, use the graph of f, so this is f of x, to estimate where f prime of x is 0, positive, and negative. Okay, think about this. f prime is 0 at any maxes or mins. It's positive wherever f is increasing, and it's negative wherever f is decreasing. So one option you have is just to use that. You don't even have to graph it. If you just look at this graph, you can see it's increasing here and here, so that's where f prime would be positive. It's decreasing here, so that's where f prime would be negative. And then the maxes and mins, of course, you can see right where those are at as well. Your other option, however, is to take and graph the derivative and, you know, actually do it. 
where it has a max or min, it's going to hit the x-axis. Where it's decreasing, it's below. Where it's increasing, it's above on the end. So you get this graph. So some that would be more of a right-brained approach, and the other is more of a left-brained approach. And we all have different ways that we prefer it. I don't care what way you do it, okay, as long as you do it and get it right, okay? F prime equals zero when x equals negative one and x equals one. F prime is greater than zero when we're on the interval from negative infinity to negative one and also from one to infinity. F prime is less than zero when x is between negative one. Answers it in a couple of different ways. How you how you how you approach the problem. Okay. Next, use the given derivative of the function to find the local extrema of the function. So part of the work was done for you. Somebody already took the derivative, and then from there you have to oh and factored it. They didn't do that. And you just have to set it equal to zero and say x equals negative one and negative three. And then do your number line test. Making sure that you put these in order from smallest to largest. Here's negative three, here's negative one. I test values around it like maybe negative four, negative two, and zero. And I plug them into the factored form of the derivative. Plugging the negative four in, I get negative and negative, which is positive overall. Plugging the negative 2 in, I get negative, positive, which is negative overall. And plugging the 0 in, I get positive, positive, which is positive overall. So I'm not going to be able to find the actual max or min. I can always tell where it is in this situation. So I can say there is a relative, or local, I guess they're asking for here, same thing. Teachers, please pardon this interruption. We have the all clear on the internet service. Um, if you're still having problems, be sure to reboot. Thank you. Good news. All right, so there's a local max at x equals negative 3, and there's a local min at x equals negative 1. Plus minus means max, and minus plus means min. Okay. Now, so here's the first one. It says, at what values of x does the graph of y equals negative x plus 2x e to the x plus x squared e to the negative x have a point of inflection? And I really liked this one because of all those e to the x's or e to the negative x's, I guess, that you see right there, okay? Um, I also see that I have a double product rule right here. So when I go to take the derivative, in order to find a point of inflection, I'm going to have to find the first derivative, the second derivative, and then set it equal to zero. Um, but I guess one thing I wanted to throw out there at you to say is, you know, this could be rewritten as this as well, which would be a product rule, but then it wouldn't be a double product rule. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I mean, you could do it either way, but if you see this, that you have a double product rule, that could get a little bit messy. So I don't know, it might be a little bit easier to rewrite it like this. Factor that e to the negative x out so that you have a product rule, but then you only have one, okay? So when I go to take the derivative of this, I take the derivative of the first, which is e to the negative x times negative 1, times the second, which is 1 plus 2x plus x squared. And then plus the first stays the same this time, and this time I take the derivative of the second. The derivative of the second is 2 plus 2x. Now, again, you've got two options. Option one, you could distribute the e to the negative x and the negative one there on the first one um, to each one and then take the derivative again. Or you could factor the e to the negative x out of both of these terms. 
if I factor the e to the negative x out of both of these terms, here this is, and I have to distribute the negative 1, negative 1 minus 2x minus x squared plus, and then what's this? 2 plus 2x. That would then simplify. So these are like algebra maneuvers that, you know, you could think to do. Negative x squared, those two cancel, plus 1. So there's your first derivative in factored form. And then I need the second derivative now. So it's a product rule. Derivative of the first is negative e to the negative x times the second, negative x squared plus 1, plus the first times the derivative of the second. Again, I could do the same thing I did before. Factor the e to the negative x out. That means this negative has to distribute, giving me x squared minus 1 plus minus 2x. So e to the negative x times x squared minus 2x minus 1. And then set it equal to 0. Now, the reason I didn't give you this one on the homework was this next step right here. Like, I figured you could handle that stuff. I didn't figure you would factor it out. I figured you would just do the double product rule. But that's why I wanted to talk about it to show you. It's a lot less work if something does factor out and use the product rule once. But this didn't factor. So e to the negative x, we know, does not ever equal 0. So we got to look at where x squared minus 2x minus 1 equals 0. And it doesn't factor, which means I have to use the um, quadratic formula. Yeah. And that was the reason I didn't give it in the homework. Okay. I still wanted to talk about it. It's still a great problem. And would AP give it to you? Heck yes, they would, you know. So it's something we still have to talk about. But here, A is 1, B is negative 2, C is negative 1. So we get X equals opposite of B plus or minus square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. Okay, so this is 2 plus or minus. This is 4 plus 4, which is the square root of 8, which is 2 rad 2 over 2. And when I divide each of these by 2, I get 1 plus or minus rad 2. So at 1 plus rad 2 and at 1 minus rad 2 are our 2x values where these things equal 0. So then we go to the number line test. Negative infinity, positive infinity. 1 plus rad 2 is going to be bigger than 1 minus rad 2. And can I use my calculator on this? No. Okay. I pick values. Well, the easiest value to pick here is between them. Zero. Do you have a general idea what the square root of 2 is? Mm -hmm. 1.4, yeah. So 1 plus 1.4 is 2.4. So I need to pick a number bigger than that. But what if I didn't know that? You know, I know it's between 1 and 2 because the square root of 2 is between the square root of 1 and the square root of 4. You know, so I could get around it, maybe pick a 5 or something. You know, like if I'm not sure on the number, it really doesn't matter the number you pick. But, you know, 3 is fine, but if you're not sure, you might pick a bigger number. Okay. And then I have to go back and plug it into this guy right here. So I have E, well, E to anything. That's going to be positive. And when I plug a negative 3 into the second one, I have 9 plus 6 is 15 minus 1, which is positive. So this section is positive. Then I plug the 0 in. The first one is positive. 0 minus 0 minus 1 is negative. And then I plug the 3 in, which is positive. 9 minus 6 minus 1, that's positive. So that's positive right there. So what was this question even asking? Inflection points? It would have, is that what the question was? Have an inflection point. It has one at both 1 minus rad 2 and 1 plus rad 2. Okay. 
So you can see that one's a little, that's, that's definitely more difficult than what I'm putting on your quiz. Okay, but sometimes I have to stretch your brain a little bit to a more difficult thing so that when you do the regular stuff, it's easier. Okay. Questions on that one? Next one, let f be a function defined by this. On which of the following intervals is the graph of f both decreasing and concave down? So decreasing means that I need um, my first derivative test. Concave down means I need the second derivative, right? So let's have at it. First derivative. The derivative of this is x squared minus 8x minus 9. It factors into x minus 9 and x plus 1. So x equals 9 and negative 1. I go to my number line. This is my first derivative. Here's negative 1. Here's 9. All right, from here I plug values in like maybe negative 2 and 0 and 10. A big number to plug in. Plugging the negative 2 in, I get negative negative, which is positive. Plugging the 0 in, I get negative positive, which is negative. And plugging the 10 in, I get plus plus, which is positive. Okay. Next, I need the second derivative. The second derivative is 2x minus 8. When I set that equal to 0, I get x equals 4. So I go to my number line. I want, I want them right next to each other so I can compare them. 4 is going to be somewhere in here. Pick a value to the left, like maybe 0, a value to the right, maybe 5. And I'm plugging them into this. So 0 minus 8, negative. And 5 into there is 10 minus 8, which is a positive. All right, so I am looking for where this thing is. Let's see. has to be both. Decreasing is in here. Concave down is here. So where do those two overlap? They overlap from negative 1 to 4. Questions on that one. You have one tomorrow that's just like this. I think this is blank right here. All right, so from there, what questions would any of you like to ask? Is there a particular problem you were working on? You got stuck on, you don't know how to do it. Tell me the problem. Happy to work problems. We've got eight more minutes I can work problems. Michael. As soon as I saw you with another paper, I thought I better go get that. Number 17 on my AP. Okay. Number 17 is a tricky one. It tells you f of negative 1 equals 1, which means that the, um, the f of x does have that point negative 1, 1. It tells you that dy over dx equals negative x squared minus xy plus y squared minus 1. And it asks what is true. You know, what of the following is true? Okay. And I thought that there wasn't enough information myself. Okay. But then I was wrong. All right. And do you remember the very last thing that I taught you last week? Second derivative test. If you have this second derivative and you have the x values, you know, where, where you know, something, what, what did they ask about this one? Uh, oh, they didn't actually say it right there. But if you have the first derivative and then you have, if you take the second derivative of it and plug into the second derivative number line, Okay, so here, let's find the second derivative. It'll be easier to explain with that. So the derivative of negative x squared is negative 2x. 
the derivative of negative xy, that is a product rule. So I have to find the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. So there's that dy dx. And then plus 2y dy dx. And derivative of negative 1 is 0. Now I have to plug this dy dx in for my dy dx here and here. So it gets a little bit ugly here. d2y over dx squared, negative 2x minus y, minus x times negative x squared minus xy plus y squared minus 1, plus 2y times negative x squared minus xy plus y squared minus 1. I did not then distribute it out. I thought, all right, all I have to do here is plug this in for x and this in for y. If I plug that in to the second derivative and it's positive, that means it's a minimum. If it's negative, that means it's a maximum. So it's that second derivative test, which was the very last thing in your notes um, that we added the other day. So here I'm going to plug in the point negative 1, 1. So when I plug a negative 1 in here, I get a positive 2. Minus 1. And then this here becomes plus 1 times. And this here, negative 1 squared is 1. And then 1 times negative is negative 1. And then I have plus 1 times 1, which is 1. Plus 1 minus 1. Plus, and then 2 times y is 2. And what's in this parenthesis is the same as what's in this one. Well, what's in the parenthesis is zero, right? The ones all cancel. So zero times two, this is zero. Zero times one, that's zero. And I have two minus one out front. So two minus one plus zero plus zero is one. So the second derivative here, is 1, which is greater than 0. It's positive. And the second derivative test says if it's positive, that means it's a minimum. Because positive means concave up. Concave up like a cup. Looks like that. It means it's going to have a minimum. And so the answer choices, I don't have one there. Um, F has a relative minimum at x equals negative 1, which is answer A. And if that would have come out negative, it would have been answer B. And if it would have come out 0, it means it doesn't have a max or min there. Okay. All right, we got three more minutes. We got another one? Something else from the AP classroom? How many of you are done with the AP classroom? completely finished with it. It's a sprinkling of you. Okay, so remember that's due by the beginning of the class tomorrow. Okay, do you have another one? 13. Number 13. This one here gives us f of x equals x cubed plus 12x minus 24. And then, hold on, mine goes to the next page. And wants to know, and all the answer choices are like increasing, decreasing, you know, that kind of stuff. So we want the first derivative for that, which is 3x squared plus 12. Set it equal to 0. You might factor a 3 out. You get x squared plus 4. And this never equals 0. And so that means we go to our number line, and that's saying that it's doing the same thing the whole entire time if nothing equals 0. So pick any number you want. 0 is the easiest. And plug it in. 0 plus 4 is positive, so I have positive times positive, which is positive. That means this graph is always increasing the entire time. Think about a cubic function. Ooh, can't it always be increasing? Right? All right. Well, that 
does it for today. You guys have a quiz tomorrow over 5-1 to 5-2.